Hey everyone, and welcome to Chapter 5 Lecture for Chem 100. This chapter is all about chemical reactions. We're going to talk about the heat transfer in chemical reactions, which is called thermodynamics. We'll talk about the speed of chemical reactions, or the study of the speed of chemical reactions, which is called reaction kinetics. And then we'll talk about some specific types of chemical reactions that are important in biochemistry. Excuse me. <sighs> I'm yawning because I'm tired of recording these because this is actually take five of this lecture. Alrighty, next slide. Moving on. How do chemical reactions occur? If we zoom in at the molecular level, what is actually going on and causing a chemical reaction to occur? So it's not just that you can mix two reactants together and boom, the chemical reaction occurs. There are two requirements for the reaction to occur. Basically, bonds need to be broken and reformed. In order for that to happen, two reactants need to collide with A, enough force to break bonds, so they need to collide hard enough, and B, they need to collide in the correct orientation to form the new bonds. So in this first one right here, these two reactants collide, but it's not hard enough to break any bonds, and so the molecules bounce off each other and go in different directions. In the second scenario, the, they collide harder, they possibly break bonds, but then the original bonds just reform, and the two molecules go off in different directions, just as they started. So in order for the reaction to happen, in other words, in order for the reactants to recombine their atoms and form different substances, they need to collide hard enough and in the correct orientation. So in this case, the carbon needs to be facing this NO3 so that when the oxygen gets popped off, it pops onto that carbon and you get these new substances. So this, the, we call this the activation energy. These, um, uh, orientation and speed requirements are known as the activation energy that you need to give the reaction a push to go. So my classic example here is you can't just put a log in a fireplace with some oxygen in the air and expect it to burn. It needs a spark. It needs some heat to start the reaction. That's the act. So the match that you put in there provides the activation energy to get the log going and then that chemical reaction of the log burning in oxygen will continue and sustain itself, but it needed that activation energy in order to go. So um, we can calculate the energy of a chemical reaction or the energy change of the chemical reaction. How much energy do we spend breaking bonds and how much energy do we gain by forming new bonds? And we call this the delta H, or the heat of the reaction. This triangle is the Greek letter delta, and in chemistry it means change. So the change in heat that occurs over the course of the reaction. And I actually changed this from your notes, so you might want to update your notes. Um, but the basic subtraction here that we're doing is we're taking the energy of the products, basically the energy that's stored in the bonds of the products, and we're subtracting the energy that's stored in the bonds of the reactants. Um, and so it basically any time in chemistry when we're calculating change of something, we're taking the final condition and we're subtracting the initial condition. So the products, energy of products minus energy of reactants. So the energy of the products is higher than the energy of the reactants. This will be a positive value. So if it's a positive value, that means that energy is absorbed in the reaction overall, and we call that an endothermic reaction. If energy of the products is lower than the energy of the reactants, then this value will be negative, meaning that the energy was released. There was more energy in the reactants, um, uh, and we released it, and so we call that an exothermic reaction. So classic examples of these types of endothermic and exothermic reactions is uh, on these following slides. So an endothermic reaction, of course, is one that absorbs heat. Endo means within, so it takes in heat. And so we can think of that as needing that it uses heat as a reactant. If it absorbs heat, it uses heat as a reactant. And a classic example of this is those instant ice packs that you can get at the pharmacy. It's basically a salt and then like a little 
bag of water or glass vial of water and you break it and the water and the salt mix and that solution or solvation reaction is actually endothermic. So it steals heat from your leg or your whatever your skin and that's why it feels cold. There's actually no such thing as cold. It's not like there's cold and hot. There's only heat and the lack of heat is the sensation of cold. So it's not actually that the bag is getting cold and the cold is transferred to your skin. It's that the bag is stealing heat and using it to fuel a chemical reaction and stealing heat from your skin. So it feels cold because you feel that lack of heat. It's a little trippy. We can also draw energy diagrams to show the thermodynamic changes that occur during the course of a reaction. So an energy diagram looks like this. It has energy on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So at the start of the reaction, we have these reactants, and then we, we do something to add activation energy, which might mean like with the logs, we add the match, okay? So that activation energy is the energy that's required to get the reaction going. And so, and sometimes it can be very large and sometimes it's very small. So up to this point here, from the energy of the reactants up to the top of this peak hill, that's our activation energy, the difference in energy there. Then it goes downhill slightly to the products. So we can see that the products are higher in energy than the reactants. So if we sub did a subtraction of product energy and reactant energy, we would get a positive delta H, a positive heat of reaction. Also, it goes uphill, which also I feel like is a positive. It gains, right? It gains energy. This delta H, the energy change is positive. It's going up, okay? Um, the opposite is the endothermic reaction. Endothermic reactions produce heat. So we can think of heat as a product. And because they're producing heat, we feel that heat released into the environment and so it would feel hot to us. So the classic example here are instant hand warmers. They're basically just little packets of iron, of shaved iron flakes or powder, and some catalysts that make this reaction go faster. And so the reaction that's happening in those little bags, actually it's just iron rusting at a really fast rate. So your car, or your bike or whatever doesn't feel feel hot as it's rusting because that rust reaction is going very slowly. But because this one is catalyzed, it goes very quickly and you feel all that heat that is produced. So if we draw the energy diagram for an endothermic reaction. They are classically downhill. Heat is released. So if we look at the energy of the reactants compared to the energy of the products, the reactants are higher. So when we do that subtraction between the energy of the products and the energy of the reactants, we get a negative delta H value. We can also see that the energy, the overall energy of this reaction is going down. This is a downhill energy diagram. And it has a smaller activation energy. And this is typical, but not always the case, that endothermic reactions have a higher activation energy than exothermic reactions. But the difference between the reactants and the peak of this hill, which we call the transition state, is the activation energy. So make sure that you understand the difference between where the activation energy is and where the heat of reaction is when you are drawing these diagrams. The heat of reaction specifically is the difference in energy between the reactants and the products. The activation energy is the difference in energy between the reactants and the transition state. Okay. Just a little semantic thing to explain in your textbook. They use the terms exergonic and endergonic instead of exothermic and endothermic. This was a change from a few editions ago that I don't like because they were trying to get a little fancy and talk about <clears throat> more than heat changes, but also some other changes that occur that help to make a reaction go, determine whether a reaction goes spontaneously or not. So for all intents and purposes, for this class, when you see exergonic in the textbook, just know that it is basically equivalent to exothermic, and endergonic is roughly equivalent to endothermic. That's a stretch, but that's what we're going to go with for this class. And same thing when the textbook, if you're reading it, 
um, mentions free energy, delta G. That's a, sort of equivalent to the heat of reaction, delta H, that we're talking about. So just trying to avoid any confusion between the textbook terms and my terms. So here's a textbook problem where it says, which of the following reaction energy, energy diagrams is exergonic, which one is endergonic? So I would rephrase that to which one is exothermic and which one is endothermic. So which is which? <clears throat> well, actually, let's start with A, which is exergonic, which is the exergonic reaction? Hopefully you picked diagram B. Exo, exergonic or exothermic means that it releases energy, so it has a downhill energy diagram. The inorganic one would be the one with the overall uphill energy diagram. Now part C asks, which is the faster reaction? We haven't talked about this yet, but just looking at those graphs, which do you think is faster, diagram A or diagram B? Hopefully you said diagram B and you would be correct. I like to imagine like a little something on a bike, like a person or a monkey, and they have to ride from the beginning of the course to the end of the course. All right, so which monkey on a bike would win? Um, it would be the one over here because it has a small uphill and a big downhill. It's gonna be able to reach the end of the course faster than the one that has the big uphill and the little downhill. And this is true, and we'll see in the next slide, that the larger the activation energy is, in other words, the larger that hill is, that uphill is, the slower the reaction goes, which makes a lot of sense visually. So we, there's a field of chemistry that studies reaction rates or the speed of chemical reactions, and that's called the study of reaction kinetics. So reactions can be fast or they can be slow. This is an example of just two generic reactions. Um, one of them is running faster, meaning that it's creating more product in less time than the other one that has a lower slope that is cre it producing like less product over time. Notice though that they both eventually reach almost the same point of product formation, that y-axis is products, they eventually create the same amount of product, but one of these reactions just does it faster than the other. So kinetics, reaction kinetics doesn't necessarily mean that a reaction produces more product total, it just means it produces more in a certain period of time. So there are different ways that we can increase or decrease the, uh, the rates of reactions. <clears throat> So the first one, we're just going to talk about three, but then we're going to watch this cute video that mentions five different ways. So the first one is temperature. If we increase temperature, so here's our reaction vessel with our um, reactants, the little blue rings and the little red balls, and our product is the blue ring red ball combo. Okay, so if we increase the temperature, we're going to increase the speed at which these molecules move around. That's what's happening in a state change. Like if you go from a liquid to a gas, you're heating it and the particles are moving faster and faster and that's what causes them to um, go to a different state. So in this case, all right, we have the particles are moving faster. It increases that kinetic energy of movement of the molecules. And so they are gonna have an increased risk of colliding hard enough with the right activation energy in order for a chemical reaction to occur. So notice we have more products in this scenario, even though we have the same number of reactants. The second way that we can increase the rate of reaction is add more reactants to that space, to that volume. So now they're more crowded, and the more crowded they are, the more likely they are to bump into each other when they're moving around. And so that will also increase the rate of reaction. And then the third thing we can do is add a catalyst. And what a catalyst does is it actually helps to bring the reactants together in order in the right orientation. And so they can actually collide in the right orientation. So that can sometimes be hard to achieve. It basically just brings them together so they're actually coming into contact with each other more often and in the correct orientation. So this is a really cute video. 
um, with some analogies. Um, Each of us has a purpose. We are destined to do something meaningful. What do you think a private Christian education looks like? GCU offers over 175 high quality online oh, programs. Find your hour. purpose at Green King University. Visit gcu.edu. All right, here we go. Meet our chemist, Harriet. She has a chemical reaction that needs to occur more quickly. Our chemist has some processes at her disposal that can help her speed up her reaction, and she knows of five ways, and to remember them, she thinks back to her days as a high school student, and the day she got a date for the dance. Harriet was in high school studying between classes. She had lost track of time and was going to be late to class. Unbeknownst to her, Harold, who was just around the corner, was running late too. They both sprinted to class, and as it happened, sprinted directly into one another. Now, this was no small collision. They ran squarely into one another in such a way that he knocked the books right out of her hand. I'm sorry, he said. Let me help you with your books. He kindly helped her recollect her belongings and politely offered to walk her to her class. And you'll never guess who went together to the dance later that year. Yep, those two. So as we can see from this example, the key to getting a date for the dance is to collide with someone and knock the books out of their hands. Now, you're probably already aware that not all collisions lead to dates for the dance, thankfully. The collisions must have two important characteristics. One, correct orientation that allows books to be knocked from one's hands, and two, enough energy to knock the books out. Shortly after this incident, Harriet decided to tell me, her chemistry teacher, all about it. I noticed some interesting parallels between her story and chemical reaction rates, which happened to be what she was studying in the hallway the day of the collision. Together, we decided to set out on two missions. Harriet wanted to help all chemistry students and chemists remember how to speed up the rate of chemical reactions, and I, being the nice guy that I am, decided to make it my mission to help create educational environments in which more book-dropping collisions can take place to increase future chemists' chances of getting a date for the dance. In order to facilitate this improved dance date-getting process, I propose five changes to all schools that parallel Harriet's five ways to increase chemical reaction rates. First, I propose that we shrink the size of the hallways. This will make it more difficult to safely navigate the hallways and will cause more collisions than in larger hallways. And by increasing the number of collisions, we increase the likelihood that some of those collisions will have the correct alignment and enough energy to create a date to the dance. Now, chemically speaking, this is equivalent to lowering the volume of a reaction vessel or a reaction mixture. In doing so, the individual particles are closer together and more collisions will occur. More collisions means a greater likelihood that collisions with the appropriate energy and configuration will happen. Second, I propose increasing the overall population of the school. More students equals more collisions. By increasing the number of particles available for collision, we create an environment where more collisions can take place. Third, we must reduce the time allowed between classes. Heck, let's just cut it in half. In doing so, students will need to move more quickly to get from one class to the next. This increase in velocity will help make sure collisions have the appropriate amount of energy necessary to ensure book dropping. This is analogous to increasing the temperature of the reaction mixture. Higher temperature means particles are moving faster. Faster moving particles means more energy and a greater likelihood of reaction causing collision. Fourth, students must stop traveling in packs. By traveling in packs, those students on the outside of the pack insulate those in the middle from undergoing any collisions. By splitting up, each student has some more area exposed that is available for a collision from a passing student. When particles travel in packs, the surface area is very small, and only the outside particles can collide. However, by breaking up the clumps into individual particles, the total surface area is increased, and each particle has an exposed surface that can react. Fifth, and finally, we hire a matchmaker. Is this colliding and book dropping too violent? Is there an easier way to get a date that requires less initial energy? And a matchmaker will help with this. The matchmaker makes it easier for a couple to get together by coordinating the match. Our matchmaker is like a catalyst. Chemical catalysts function by lowering the activation energy. In other words, by lowering the energy required to start a reaction. They do this by bringing two particles together and orienting them correctly in space so that the two can meet at the correct configuration and allow a reaction to take place. So, to sum up. If a future chemist wants a date for the dance, he must collide with another person and knock the books out of their hands. And if a chemist wants to make a chemical reaction occur, the particles must collide in the correct orientation with an appropriate amount of energy. 
And both of these processes can be accelerated using the five methods I've described. And that was a quick peek of my vocabulary video there in the background. All right. So hopefully now you have a good idea of different ways to speed up a chemical reaction. I went through a couple of extra ones. I think there were five in that video. There's just three that we're really talking about in this class. But I just thought it was a really cute analogy and helpful way to remember these different ways of affecting reaction rates. So that last way, using a catalyst or a matchmaker in the analogy, was um, the way that that works is catalyst actually reduces the activation energy. So if we look at a reaction energy diagram, this one would be exothermic, it's overall downhill, okay? And there's the activation energy of the normal reaction. When we add a catalyst, we make that hill smaller. We reduce the activation energy, which is why it speeds up the reaction, because it helps to orient the molecules so that they can undergo a chemical reaction. It reduces the activation energy. In other words, it provides sort of an easier path for the reactants to go through with less of a hill to climb. <clears throat> so in biological systems, enzymes are the most common type of catalyst. Enzymes are made of protein and just a little bit of terminology around surrounding enzymes. The reactants for the reaction will bind to the enzyme at a site called the active site. It's called the active site because that's where the action or the catalysis actually occurs. So they bind there, they're properly oriented, the reaction occurs, and the product is formed and leaves the enzyme. And we'll talk a lot more about enzymes and how they work in chapter 9 when we talk about proteins. But they are very important biological catalysts speeding up chemical reactions. So a specific type of chemical reaction that's very common and important is combustion reactions. So a combustion reaction always has the same format. The reactants are always some kind of organic molecule, which means a carbon-containing molecule, and oxygen. Those are the reactants. And the products are always carbon dioxide and water, and sort of in parentheses, heat or energy is produced. And we use these combustion reactions to fuel things all the time. We use it to fuel our car. We put octane, in gasoline is mostly octane, which is an organic compound, and it reacts with oxygen in the air to form carbon dioxide and water, <clears throat> and energy, the energy to actually move your car. And the water dribbles out of the exhaust pipe, as does the carbon dioxide, which then goes into the atmosphere and serves as a greenhouse gas that contributes to global warming, but that's another class. Um, we also can use organic molecules to fuel our bodies when we eat food, right? One class of, of nutrients that we eat are carbohydrates. Glucose, being the most simple sugar in the class of carbohydrates, is an organic molecule that is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And it burns in oxygen, and it also forms carbon dioxide, water, and energy. It's energy that our body uses. We also make some water for ourselves through breaking down food. And we produce carbon dioxide, which is why we have to breathe out that carbon dioxide. All right? So combustion reactions always have this format here. This is something to memorize. That whatever molecule you're asked to do a combustion reaction with, you are adding oxygen as the other reactant, and the products are carbon dioxide, water, and potentially energy. So alkanes are organic compounds that are great fuel sources that we talked about in chapter four. Um, methane is commonly used in Bunsen burners, and propane in gas stoves, and butane is used in, um, what's it called, cigarette lighters. So these are all, and of course, octane in your car. So on the previous slide, the combustion reactions were written as if they were perfectly clean reactions, a complete combustion reaction, right? But in reality, some of this carbon and oxygen, these side reactions can occur. And so you get these other sort of byproducts or side products. It's not cleanly 100% water and carbon dioxide that occurs. One of the common um, compounds that's of a side reaction of combustion is carbon. So that's where you get like soot from. Um, or the you know nasty black clouds of of 
smoke that come out of engines that are not clean burning. And those are ones that just don't have great um, ability to combust cleanly. Um, there's certain fuels that combust more cleanly. The higher the quality of the fuel, the, more, the cleaner the combustion. So you don't get that smoggy exhaust out of the pipe. That is not part of the carbon dioxide in water. That is part of actual carbon uh, molecules that are produced is byproducts. All right, so let's do a sample problem here. Um, and this gives us half of the combustion reaction. So it tells us that we have propane, C3H8, and oxygen. And it wants us to do two things. It wants us to provide the products, step one, and balance the equation. And that's going to be step two. And it's important that you do these as two different steps. If you try to do them both in one step, you will be wrong. All right, so what are the products of a combustion reaction? What are going to be the products of this reaction? Well, it's a combustion reaction. So it doesn't matter what the products are. We know that by definition, the products are going to be carbon dioxide and water. You can also write heat here, but heat's not going to be involved in the balancing. And really, I'm mostly interested in the chemical products here. So I'm going to leave heat out or I'll put also heat in parentheses. We'll do it like that. Um, so heat usually isn't actually listed as a product or a reactant, but I like to, to show the difference between endothermic and exothermic reactions. All right, so of course, this reaction, combustion, is an exothermic reaction since heat is a product. All right, now that we have the correct products written in, carbon dioxide and water, now we can balance. So now we can do the second part here. And of course, we'll do that by making our table C, H, and O. We have three carbons on the reactant side, one on the product side. We have eight hydrogens on the reactant side, and we have two on the product side. And we have two oxygens on the reactant side, and two plus one makes three on the product side. So now I'm going to start at the top. I'll start with carbon. Why not? So I have three here, and I want three here. So I'm going to put a three on the product side. So there's three carbon dioxide, means we have three carbons. But now we have three times two, which is six oxygens, plus one oxygen makes seven oxygens. All right, that's an odd number. I'm going to do hydrogens next. So we've got 8 over here. We can make 8 over here by adding a 4. So 4 times 8, or sorry, 4 times 2 is 8. And 4 times 1 is 4 oxygens plus 6 oxygens makes 10 oxygens. And over here, now we need to balance the oxygens. If we add a 5 in front of O2, 5 times 2 is 10. So don't forget how to balance equations from chapter 1. You still need to know how to do that. If you need a refresher, you might want to go back to chapter 1, practice that a little bit more, um, because you will be asked to balance combustion reactions to finish, to write either write them in completion um, and balance them, or to finish them by writing the products and balance them. Another important type of chemical reaction in, bio, in biology, especially, are these oxidation and reduction reactions, which we just call redox reactions for short. Kind of like we called, what was it? Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, Brangelina, like you combine them. I forget what that's called. I think it's called a portmanteau. Anyway, redox reactions. So there are two types of redox reactions. There are those. There are inorganic redox reactions that involve like metal ions and charge differences. And then there are organic redox reactions that involve removal of oxygen and hydrogen from carbon containing organic molecules. Um, both types of those redox reactions occur in biological systems. And in both cases, oxidation involves, always involves loss of electrons and reduction always involves gain of electrons. All right. In organic, we're going to follow the loss and gain 
of hydrogen and oxygen, which makes it a little bit more confusing. But we're going to talk about each of these in turn. This is just sort of the summary slide, the cheat slide to come back to. So for inorganic redox reactions, we are going to remember this um, mnemonic here, oil rig. Oil stands for oxidation is loss of electrons, and rig stands for reduction is gain of electrons. So if we look here at these sort of cartoon molecules, all right, um, I'm going to say you can ignore these terms down here for the pin, all right? Ignore these. It just adds extra confusion, okay? Um, so we have this orange molecule and this red molecule. And in the course of this reaction, the orange molecule transfers an electron to the red molecule. So the orange one loses an electron. It is, then we can say that it is oxidized. The red one gains an electron over the course of the reaction. So we say that it is reduced. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. And so this is how we identify oxidation and reduction in inorganic reactions. We look for the transfer of electrons. <clears throat> and we can do that by looking at the difference in charges. So this is that classic oxidation reaction of rust oxidizing and becoming, sorry, iron oxidizing and becoming rust. So um, we can give all of these atoms, the iron and oxygen um, atoms or ions, charges. We can assign them charges in this equation. So pure solid iron, all right, atomic iron, atoms of iron are neutral by definition. So they have a charge of zero. Oxygen, pure oxygen, all right, um, also is going to have a charge of zero. This is a covalent compound and it's not made of charged particles. It's pure oxygen in its natural state. Elemental oxygen has a, has a charge of zero. These are atoms of oxygen that we're talking about. But then we look over here, iron oxide, Fe2O3. This is a metal and a nonmetal. This by definition is an ionic compound. Oops. All right. That metal plus a metal means we're talking about an ionic compound. And ionic compounds are made of ions. And ions have charges. So we need to figure out what the charges are on these two ions. So for oxygen, we know that the charge is negative two because oxygen is a group six element and it's always negative two. And in the problem, it tells us about iron three ions. So we can deduce that this iron is iron three plus charge. We can also figure it out by doing sort of a reverse of the crossover technique. So if iron has a two minus charge, sorry, if oxygen has a two minus charge and there's three of them, then the iron must have a three plus charge because there's two of them. And ionic compounds need to be neutral overall. The charges have to cancel out, right? So, okay, so now that we know the charges, we can look at what happened to the charges and the electrons over the course of this reaction. So the iron went from having a zero charge to a three plus charge, all right? The charge became more positive because it lost electrons. Electrons are negative, all right? So the, it became more positive because of the loss of electrons, so we know it's oxidation. The easier way to start, I think, is to find the one whose charge was reduced, all right? So in this one, the oxygen went from a zero charge here to having a negative two charge. The charge went down because it gained electrons, all right? But it's easier to me, it's less backwards, when I think of the fact that the charge is reduced. It's called reduction because the charge goes down, zero to negative two. Then we say this one is reduced. It's reduced because of gaining electrons, which is kind of a little bit of mental gymnastics to think about. But remember, electrons are negatively charged. So if you gain them, you're gonna become more negative. Your charge will be reduced. So I always feel like it's easier to find the reduction and then the other thing is the oxidation. <clears throat> so an example of inorganic um, 
redox reactions occurring in the body occur in the electron transport chain, which is the last part of metabolism. It's the part of the cell that actually generates ATP, cellular energy. And so it is called the electron transport chain because electrons literally flow through this series of proteins and, and basically generate electricity that fuels the formation of ATP. And it has these electrons flowing through redox reactions, gain and loss of electrons. So there is a part of this electron transport chain called cytochrome C, and cytochrome C has this molecule that binds iron ions. And so it transfers electrons through these different um, oxidation states of iron. So iron two plus charge will lose electrons and become iron three plus. So when it, and then it becomes iron two plus when it gains electrons, transfers them over here, loses the electrons. So it's just shuttling back and forth, grabbing electrons and transferring them. All right. So in this case, I said, is the iron and cytochrome C being reduced or oxidized? We said that it is losing electrons. So its charge is going up. That means it's being oxidized. All right, so let's do a sample problem. In the following reaction, determine which of the reactants is undergoing oxidation and which is undergoing reduction. So the first thing we need to do is assign charges to everything here. All right, so here we have calcium, just plain old elemental atoms of calcium. They have no charge, so they have a number of zero. Sulfur, again, plain old sulfur, there's an atom of sulfur, all right, zero charge. There's no, it's not sulfur minus two. It's not a sulfur ion. It's just a sulfur atom. But here we have an ionic compound, a metal and a nonmetal bonded together. So we know that these are actually ions of calcium and sulfur. Well, calcium is in um, column two, group two of the periodic table. So it has two valence electrons that it will lose and end up with a positive two charge. So make sure you still know how to find um, the charge of an ion using your periodic table. Sulfur is group six, six valence electrons. It'll gain two and form an ion with a two minus charge. So those two charges will cancel out and we end up with our neutral ionic compound here. So now we can look at these, these two um, elements. Calcium went from having a zero charge to having a two plus charge. And the sulfur went from having a zero charge to having a two minus charge. So I like to figure out which one is being reduced first because that one's less mental gymnastics for me. So which one's charge got reduced over time? Was it calcium or sulfur? The correct answer is sulfur. It went from zero to negative two. So this one is the one that got reduced. All right. And this one, calcium, is the one that got oxidized. And although it's confusing to think about, it got oxidized because it lost electrons. Oxidation is loss, oil rig. And the one on the bottom is reduced because the charge is reduced, but the charge is reduced because it gained electrons. Oil rig, reduction is gain of electrons. It just feels very backwards to say something is reduced when it's gaining because those two words are opposite, have opposite meaning in English. But mathematically, if you're gaining something that's negatively charged, then you're losing charge. So your charge is reduced. It's where that comes from. It's very confusing. If it confuses you, you are not alone. You, are, you have plenty of company with other introductory chemistry students. It's just something that takes practice. And that for me is easiest to do if I remember that reduction 
is the reduction of the charge, and I can identify that one first. So in organic compounds, we kind of replace, we can still use that oil rig mnemonic, and we can say that oxidation is loss. Um, it's still loss of electrons, but we don't really have a good way of counting electrons with organic molecules, that's simple. So instead we can say that oxidation is loss of hydrogen, because when organic molecules lose um, electrons, they often, they also lose hydrogen. So in this case, oxidation is loss of hydrogen, and reduction is gain of hydrogen. Um, another way to sort of think of it, or, all right, oxidation is gain of oxygen, which is where the term originally came from. Oxidation reactions involve the adding of oxygen, but then they broaden that definition to include loss of electrons or loss of hydrogen. So oxidation is loss of hydrogen or gain of oxygen, and reduction is gain of hydrogen or loss of oxygen. Okay, so this is maybe something just a rule to star and refer to and use when you're practicing these problems until you have it memorized. So here's an example of a functional group. So this is an aldehyde functional group. It's got a carbonyl, a carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen, and single bonded to a hydrogen. And then here's the rest of the molecule, right? So if we were going to reduce this, reduction is gain of hydrogen, or loss of oxygen, and in this case, reduction involves gaining hydrogen. So we have one hydrogen here, and then we add hydrogen, and we end up with one, two, three hydrogens. So we go from an al aldehyde functional group to an alcohol functional group, an OH group. If we oxidize this, a molecule with an aldehyde group, then we either um, add oxygen or we lose hydrogen. So in this case, we went one hydrogen to one hydrogen, so we didn't lose any hydrogen, but we went from one oxygen to two oxygens, which is the sign that we had oxidation because we gained oxygen. And this is a different functional group now called a carboxylic acid. C double bonded to an O, single bonded to an OH. So a sample problem here, it says in the following reaction, determine if the organic reactant is undergoing oxidation or reduction. So we're asking, well, the first thing we can ask is, are we gaining or losing hydrogen? So use that oil rig mnemonic. So which one uh, is what's happening? Are we gaining or losing hydrogen? Let's check our hydrogens. So in the reactant, the benzoic acid, we have one hydrogen. And in the product, we have one, two, three hydrogens. So we're gaining hydrogen. gain, sorry, I'm slow here, gain hydrogen, all right, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain, so this is getting reduced, I just wrote red, all right, another way we could check is we could look at the oxygens, so we don't need to because we already figured it out by looking at the hydrogens, but over here we have one two oxygens, and over here we only have one oxygen. So oxidation is gaining of oxygens, but we lost an oxygen. So that's another way, since we lost oxygen. So in this example, either one of those definitions would work. We lost oxygen, which is also a definition of reduction. That won't always be the case. So in the previous slide, we either gained, we either changed the number of hydrogens or changed the number of oxygens. But in this example, we did both. Um, reduction involved both gain of hydrogen and loss of oxygen. So oxidation reactions in cells are really important. That combustion reaction that we talked about before of glucose being combusted in oxygen it doesn't exactly burn in one reaction. It actually, there's multiple reactions where that oxygen is actually used to oxidize things. So oxygen, we need to breathe oxygen because of this whole process of cellular respiration, of um, burning molecules in oxygen. 
So oxygen is a really important chemical for us to live. We can't live without it. But it also can be very dangerous because oxygen can form free radicals, which are um, sort of charged, rogue charged particles that can um, go around and damage tissues and other molecules and, and other um, components of cells. And so it's kind of funny because oxygen is vital for life, but it's also slowly killing us. And so we actually, all organisms that use oxygen for cellular respiration also have a variety of enzymes that actually help to break down the damaging products of oxygen. Um, and we call these things antioxidants. Antioxidants are things that actually help us to um, block the harmful products of oxygen. So it's this kind of double-edged, not a double-edged sword, I don't know what you call it, but it's it's a thing we need, but it's also a thing that can be harmful to us. So there's sort of a balance. We have to keep a careful balance of oxygen levels in our body. Um, another important type of chemical reaction, so we've talked about combustion and redox reactions. And then the third type are these condensation and hydrolysis reactions. So these involve water, the gain or loss of water, essentially. Um, so in a condensation reaction, you're actually losing water. So you're removing a hydrogen or two hydrogens and an oxygen from the reactants, and you end up with a water molecule. You'll also notice that in condensation reactions, you take two reactants and you form one product from them. I mean, there's still two products because water is a product, but you're, you're binding them together. So condensations are what we call a type of synthesis reactions. They build things, they link things together, and in the process, remove water. Um, we also call condensation reactions dehydration reactions. Those two terms are synonymous. And I remember condensation reactions produce water because I think of like a, gla like a cold glass of tea or lemonade in the summer. I'm actually drinking one right now and it's sweating all over my table. Um, that sweat that builds up on the outside of the, of the cold glass or a plastic cup is called condensation. So condensation, you get formation of water molecules. So that's how I remember that water is a product. Hydrolysis is a reaction in the reverse direction. So where you take water, and you break the water molecule and you attach it to the two products here. So in this case, it's been broken and attached to the molecules. So in a hydrolysis reaction, this is actually a type of decomposition reaction where one molecule gets broken into two using water as the thing that helps break them up. All right, so a classic example is condensation and hydrolysis of the energy molecule ATP. So ATP actually gives us energy by undergoing hydrolysis. So there are three phosphate groups. That's what it, this molecule means, adenosine triphosphate, three phosphates. And when it reacts with water, that last phosphate group breaks off. And that bond that breaks releases a lot of energy. There was a lot of energy in that bond. <clears throat> um, and this hydrolysis reaction, excuse me, <clears throat> this hydrolysis reaction is actually very exothermic. It produces a lot of energy. And so that's why we use it as the energy molecule because when we add water, we actually create a lot of energy by breaking off that bond. So this is it in cartoon form. Here's our adenosine triphosphate, three phosphates. And when it undergoes hydrolysis, we break off one of those phosphates and we end up with also water here as a byproduct and energy. And we can do it in reverse. That's how we actually replenish our ATP stores. We basically run this reaction in reverse. And in that case, it's a condensation reaction. So we are actually forming water as a byproduct. I think I said water over here, but I meant energy. All right, so in the hydrolysis reaction, we use water. Water is a reactant, and it creates, it breaks down a large molecule into two smaller molecules and creates energy. Condensation reactions, in reverse, we are producing water. 
um, and it's a synthesis reaction, so we're reattaching these things. Another type of chemical reaction that I'm just going to mention briefly that's really important in biological systems are these phosphorylation reactions. So um, phosphate groups can be used to turn things on and off in cells. Enzymes, a lot of times, are regulated, meaning they can be turned on and off so that if you don't need to use them, you can just turn them off and they won't do the job. So you can have an active enzyme and then you take ATP and you break off that phosphate group and you put that phosphate group on the enzyme and that turns it off. And then you, we call that a phosphorylation reaction. And then if you want to take the phosphate off, it's called a dephosphorylation reaction. Um, so phosphorylation reactions involve condensation of ATP and dephosphorylation reactions involve hydrolysis of ATP. But um, we won't get into those, and I don't, won't ask you to know the definitions. So the molecule, the enzymes that do phosphorylation, that add, that transfer phosphates groups onto things, are called kinases, and the ones that cut them off are called phosphatases. So they're very popular in cells, but we won't really get into that in this class. But you might in a future class involving some cell bio biology or cell chemistry. So in this problem, it says identify the following reactions as representations of a condensation or a hydrolysis. So some of the problems in the textbook just give you these sort of, you know, visual, like cartoony forms of a problem. Um, so in this case, we have one molecule here and water, and it reacts to form these two molecules and no water. So water is a reactant and we used it to break something up into two smaller things. So this is an example of a hydrolysis reaction. So this would be hydrolysis. I'm just gonna do hydro. And the giveaways, the two giveaways, if I had to explain why I called this hydrolysis, would be because A, water is a reactant, and B, because we took a large molecule and broke it up into two smaller molecules. In this example here, we have two molecules that react to combine into one molecule and form water as a product. So this would be a condensation reaction. And if I was asked to explain how I knew that, I could say, well, I knew it by two ways. One, water was a product, and two, we took two smaller things and combined them into one larger thing, which we call a type of synthesis reaction. So the synthesis and decomp, I've been using the word synthesis and decomposition reaction. The most general way to um, classify chemical reactions is in one of these sort of three or four types of reactions. So you can have synthesis reactions. Synthesis means building, to build. So in a synthesis reaction, you're ultimately taking um, two reactants and forming one product. You're combining them together. And if you do lots of those in a row, you can take little single atoms and build them together into long, big, complex molecules. So a classic example of synthesis reaction is building proteins from amino acids. Amino acids are small molecules. You link a bunch of them together and you build a protein. Decomposition reactions are the opposite. It's when you take something larger and you break it up into something smaller. So decomposition reactions usually have one reactant and two products. So for example, when you're breaking down nutrients, like starch is a long chain of glucose molecules and a, we break it up into individual glucose molecules through a series of decomposition reactions. Then lastly, we have the exchange reactions. And these involve sort of swapping of partners. So you can have a single exchange or displacement or a double dischain, double exchange or displacement. So in a single exchange, you have AB plus C, and then AB break up, and B instead partners with C. So then you have A plus CB. So I like to call this a homewrecker um, type of reaction. So if you think of AB as like a couple, 
that are together, maybe they're married, and then C comes in and breaks up the marriage and steals the husband, and so now A is single and B and C are together. So I call it a homewrecker reaction, a single displacement. A single lady comes in and steals the man and leaves the original lady um, single. A double displacement reaction is what I call a swingers reaction. I don't have an animation for that. But in this case, you have two couples, like maybe two ionic compounds, and they swap partners. So A and B are coupled, and C and D are coupled, and then they swap partners. So now A is with D, and B is with C. And so that's a double displacement, that both um, pairs switch partners. And an actual chemical reaction example here, we have HCl, all right, and we have MgOH, so magnesium hydroxide, the magnesium and the hydroxides. And so in the product, we have magnesium chloride, so the magnesium and the chloride uh, bonded together, and water, so the hydroxides and the hydrogens bonded together. So there was a swapping of partners there. So this little last sample problem here is to categorize each of the following reactions as synthesis, decomposition, or exchange. So in part A, we have Fe2O3 and carbon. So we have a binary compound here. It's made of two things. And uh, over here, we have just elemental carbon that's made of one thing. All right, and then now we have carbon dioxide, CO2, that's binary, it has two things, and iron. So what happened here was a swapping. This would be one of those homewrecker reactions where the iron um, and the oxygen were together, but then iron got ditched and replaced by, by carbon. So this would be a single displacement. Single. displacement or single exchange. It would be an exchange reaction. I guess if I'm answering the question, it would be an exchange reaction. And in parentheses, I'll write, it would be a single exchange or single displacement exchange reaction. In part B here, we have aluminum oxide. So we just have a single reactant and it's um, being broken down into aluminum and oxygen. So it's a single reactant that's breaking down into two products. So that would be a type of decomposition reaction right there. And then lastly, we have a reaction of hydrogen and iodine. So we've got two things and the product is hydrogen iodide, which is one thing. So we have two reactants um, forming one product. So this would be a type of synthesis reaction. We're taking two things and combining them into one. We're building something. We're synthesizing. All right. The last thing to note that's going to become important in the next chapter is that chemical reactions, a lot of times we've been talking about, we've been mostly talking about them as if the reactants form products, the end reaction is over, and that does happen. We call those irreversible reactions, that they can't be reversed. And so you take A plus B, and they, reform, and they form AB, and that's it. You're stuck there. Combustion reactions are classic irreversible reactions. All right, you put gas in your car, you combust it, and then you need to refill the gas. There's nothing you can do to reverse the combustion and refill your gas tank spontaneously by like driving in reverse or anything. No, you have to, you have to get more reactants. But in biology, in biological systems and cells, a lot of reactions are actually reversible. You can take the reactants, combine them to form product, but then if you need to, you can take that product and reverse the reaction and make more of those reactants. We saw that in the examples with um, hydrolysis and condensation, reduction and oxidation, those are all reversible reactions, whereas combustion is an irreversible reaction. So we indicate a reversible reaction by using a two-way arrow, and an irreversible reaction is indicated with a one-way arrow. 
So a quick practice problem here is just to determine whether the reactions are reversible or irreversible. So the first one gives us a reaction with a two-way arrow. So that is a giveaway and tells us that it is reversible. Versus part B, which gives us a one-way arrow, which tells us this reaction is not going backwards. It cannot go in reverse, so it is irreversible. The third one gives us a scenario that I already gave you, which is burning gasoline in your automobile engine. And then you have to think about that. Well, can I go in reverse and make more gasoline after I've burned it? No. If only, that would be great. It would save us all a lot of money. Somebody could figure out how to make combustion of gasoline a reversible reaction. Then we could just magically refill our gas tanks. But unfortunately, we have to pay to refill our gas tanks because it is an irreversible reaction. And that, my friends, is the end of the Chapter 5 lecture. I hope you enjoyed. Bye!